Good evening, everybody, and um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, MedArtists have very kindly asked me to provide a talk, an educational talk on the management of Liz Frank pathology. Uh, my wife is, has gone out for a run, the two children are downstairs, so hopefully we won't get a couple of unexpected guests, but anything's possible. Um, it's not really possible to talk about Liz Frank injuries without mentioning who Liz Frank is. Um, the injury itself is named after this uh, gentleman, who's Jacques Lys Franc de Saint Martin. He's a French uh, gynecologist and general surgeon from the Napoleonic era in France, and he used to work in the. He was a field surgeon for the for the French army. He didn't have any X-rays, obviously, back at that time. So he diagnosed fractures on the basis of um, the sounds that he made when moving it with a stethoscope, which um, I think would probably not go down terribly well nowadays. Um, interestingly, he didn't actually describe the fracture. He simply described, oh, being heckled by Siri as well. Um, he didn't actually describe the fracture. He described a means of performing a relatively bloodless amputation without the use of a saw on the battlefield for injuries sustained when people fell off their horses, etc. But nonetheless, since then, his um, name has become synonymous with the Lis Frank joint articulation and the uh, fractures that are associated with that. So when we talk about the Lisfranc joint, this is what we mean. It's basically the complex of articulations associated with the tarsal metatarsal joints at the base of the foot, predominantly the TMT joints themselves. But the definition when you're talking about Lisfranc fractures tends to also include the intercuneiform joints a little. The functional Lisfranc joint is interesting. The metatarsals themselves are obviously really quite a long lever arm in the point of the foot. And that's where the junction then goes to uh, the tarsal bones in the midfoot. So you have effectively the very flexible ankle, then you have a group of joints quite close together, all very stable, very well secured. And then you have the long lever arm of the metatarsals ahead of them, which means that the tarsal metatarsal joints themselves become a little bit of a weak point. And it tends to be that reason, I think, that these areas uh, get injured. There is a variable function depending which column of the list frank joint complex you're looking at. And we tend to think of the list frank articulation as three columns. The lateral column is made up of the fourth and fifth metatarsals with the cuboid. And those are actually the most mobile of the joints. And it's important wherever possible to, pres to preserve that mobility to optimize the function of the foot. That movement then drops down as you go into the middle column, which is the second and third um, TMT joints, to the extent that there is very, very little movement indeed by the time you get to the second TMT joint. And the second TMT joint is both recessed back further in the foot between the uh, medial and the internate, immediate cuneiforms, but also on the sagittal view, oh, sorry, on the uh, um, axial view of the foot, as you'll see in a minute, it's recessed more as a keystone construct and in fact is known as the keystone of the foot. The medial column, on the other hand, variably you can think about this just being the first metatarsal in the medial cuneiform or even extending back to the navicular, again regains a fair degree of movement, and that's both sagittal and coronal. And it's this movement that I think causes some of the uh, pathology that we see arising from the list rank joint that you might experience in the more elective setting. Um, but equally, maintaining that movement, therefore, is possibly maybe associated with improved overall foot function. So this is the uh, transverse view that I said I'd mentioned a minute. And you can see how the, the intermediate cuneiform sits like the keystone of the arch um, in between the medial and interme intermediate. The stability of the um, list frank joint is predominantly on the plantar aspect. That's really where the money is. Obviously, the joints are surrounded by a capsule. But the dorsal capsule is a much more nebulous aponeurotic structure and, and just the simple capsular structure and a little bit of thickening rather than the really truly strong ligaments that you see on the plantar side. And the real um, emphasis goes on the list frank ligament, which is that sort of bifurcate structure you can see coming from the um, medial cuneiform across the base of the second and third. And that's the uh, ligament that is often associated with the avulsion fractures that we see and look for very closely when we're looking for these injuries. So the list frank itself can be involved in several different forms of pathology around the foot. The one that I'm going to concentrate on this talk is traumatic injuries. Um, the reason for that is instability of the list frank areas is basically an entire topic on itself that's been dealt with uh, on a previous webinar by Christian Plass in a lot more eloquence than I would probably ascribe to it. It's a talk I can thoroughly recommend looking at. 
And the degenerative change is a relatively more straightforward topic, but the approaches and the management is very similar to that we would use in trauma. So I'm going to concentrate on the on the traumatic side of the list, Frank, both from the initial presentation, diagnosis, through to the treatment strategies that you can employ. So thinking about the list, Frank injuries. How do they occur? Historically, and if you look at the textbooks, it's often ascribed to being a high energy injury that occurs during uh, road traffic accidents. And that certainly is the case. As the foot is driven back into uh, from the footwell in an impact such as this, you are at risk of getting a road traffic, a road traffic induced list frank injury. Fortunately, in my practice in a large district general hospital, I'm not in a level one trauma center. And this aspect of list frank injuries has largely now passes me by. And I don't tend to get the exposure of the, of the polytraumatized patient. However, you can still have high energy type patterns of list frank injuries in an isolated setting. Sports injuries can associate with that and the falls and dislocations around the foot that any practicing trauma surgeon will see can still lead to the high energy pattern fractures. They tend to be associated with much more comminution, maybe more significant dislocation than you might see in the lower energy injuries. In my practice, the low energy injuries are more common. And actually, I think they're probably more difficult to manage and certainly more difficult to identify. The severity of the force that can create these injuries can be surprisingly minor and is probably at least in part responsible for the very significant miss rate on initial presentation that these injuries suffer from. An alternative way of looking at the mechanism of injury is through how that force is applied to the foot. And this is where you come across the concept of the direct versus the in indirect injuries to the list frank ligament quite confusing nomenclature, but a direct injury essentially is, is a direct crush on the dorsum of the foot. I saw one of these this afternoon from a lady who works in our local supermarket, dropped a heavy crate of bananas onto the top of her foot. Not a common mechanism of injury in Middle England, but she did. And she sustained a fortunately undisplaced direct mechanism, Liz Frank injury on her foot. The indirect injuries, on the other hand, are more the axial loading on the plantar flexed foot, uh, as you see in this in this drawing, classically sort of the ballet on point position, or if you look in the textbooks, you'll see the pictures of the um, football players where some another player lands on the heel of a foot where, in a, where the foot's in a driving off position with the cleats embedded in the ground. Um, more commonly, I have to say, for what I see, is a slip off a curb. That simple putting your heel on the edge of a curb, on the edge of a footpath, forces the foot down into plantar flexion and they then slip off the curve and land on the point of the on the foot and that can be a very very innocuous very unsuspecting injury that can lead to quite significant list frank pathology these are the ones that are really often missed when you uh, when they present to A&E because the mechanism is so benign and the the fractures are so subtle when you look on x-ray that they often present late and that creates their own problems so bearing in mind that up to 40 or 50 percent of these are missed how can we avoid that? As I said, they are often subtle. The mechanism of injury with that plantar flexion of the foot gives you a little bit of a clue, or perhaps football twisting, wearing cleats, rugby, impact sports, etc., or fall from height. But th that could really be quite misleading. You really need to be on your toes when you're looking out for these. Think about where the location of the patient's symptoms is. They will classically localize their pain towards the midfoot. The bruising can be quite extensive, but they will localize their pain and dysfunction towards the midfoot and point you very clearly in that direction. And if they do that, you need to look very, very carefully and think about additional imaging uh, modalities if your plain x-rays aren't adequate. We all, I hope, know about the plantar ecchymosis sign. Um, and again, this is something that I spend a lot of time teaching my trainees on. If you see this bruising pattern as you see in this x-ray, sorry, in the clinical picture opposite, if you see that on a patient who's had a recent trauma, however minor you think it might be, you need to spend good time looking for a list frank injury and they need to be reviewed and serially x-rayed until you are happy there is no list frank injury. Deformity is not initially common. Um, you have to have a very significant list frank injury before deformity is part of the initial presentation. Uh, presenting complaint. But the instability that arises at the midfoot as part of the destabilization of the TMT joints from the injury can result in quite subtle progressive deformity over weeks. Probably the most spectacular advantage uh, example of this I can give you is a premiership football player that um, I saw as part of my fellowship uh, who had a twisting injury two weeks earlier or three weeks earlier just in a training match and 
had been complaining that his foot was really quite sore. The treating physicians at the team had been looking at it as just a midfoot sprain, which is warning sign on its own. But then they brought him into the physiotherapist to get strapped up before going out to, to try and do some of his first returns to running. And they noticed that the space between his first and second toes on that foot was increasing. And basically that was a representation of a slightly proximalist Frank variant and the, and the midfoot was just gently splaying out. And that was enough for the physicians to refer on for, for secondary care. The final one to just keep an eye out for is function. These are obviously sore injuries and certainly one of the diagnostic challenges initially is the fact they can't wait there. But in the sporting situation where you've got keen individuals who are desperately trying to get back to sport, if you haven't identified a specific injury and four, five, six weeks later, they're still complaining of an inability to stand up on tiptoe or to single leg eagle raise on that side and focusing that point tenderness towards the middle of the foot. Again, you really need to look for a list rank injury and you have to think back to that uh, lever arm structure of the metatarsal onto the cuneiforms and realize quite how much force is going through that area. <clears throat> so then we, we come on to the imaging. Your, your um, alarm bells are ringing and you start thinking, right, I need to get some more x-rays. Now, plain film is obviously where you're going to start. It's what the casualty office, officers will arrange for you and it's often where the pitfalls first starting to arise. When the patients are seen in a &E, they will almost universally be too painful and too sore to get a weight-bearing x-rays. Top that off, on, on first presentation, the radiographers will be reluctant to ask a patient to weight-bear. You often get a simple non-weight-bearing x-ray, such as the one you see here. When you're looking at these, sorry, I was, uh, just jumped ahead a little bit. When you're looking at these, you need to understand what you're trying to look at. And it's a series of lines effectively that will help you try and pick up the subtle injuries. First of all, you're looking at the space between the base of the first metatarsal and the second. And there are arbitrary numbers that are out there as to the maximum space that exists. And I think those can occasionally be misleading. If you think it's a bit wide, look further, look closer. If you're still not sure, you could consider com getting comparative, view, comparative views to the other side, but a lot of radiology departments don't like doing that. Look to see if the base of the first is looking congruent on the medial cuneiform. Then also look to see if the medial aspect of the second metatarsal lines up to the medial border of the intermediate cuneiform, and it should draw a very nice straight line. Any subluxation, however subtle, you need to look further. The oblique view then also gives it further information. You have the lateral border of the second metatarsal to the lateral border of the, second, of the intermediate cuneiform, and then the medial and lateral borders of the third lining up onto the lateral cuneiform. And again, there should be no significant steps or subluxations here. There is another sign that I've seen talked about before, which is the Nile sign, where the Lisfranc joints themselves start looking like they're widening out like the delta of a river, hence the, the Nile delta. I'm not so convinced that's a particularly useful sign. I think if you see it, great, but um, I haven't, I certainly haven't identified it myself. It may have seen me, but I haven't noticed it. Um, as I said, once you do get the plain films initially, it can be very difficult to identify any obvious pathology. This weight-bearing x-ray here, for example, you'd, you'd have to say your casualty officer would be on um, particularly good day to notice anything significant going on here. Even when you zoom in, it's a very subtle little fleck of calcification that you're seeing in the zone of the Lisfranc ligament at that um, proximal lateral border of the first metatarsal that might give you an indication something might be going on. By the time you see the patient at two weeks though, the patients are usually able to put weight on the foot and that weight bearing through the foot sufficient to cause discomfort to the patient at that stage is usually enough to create a degree of instability and to give you that stressed x-ray that will give you an identification that there is instability here and you can see on this x-ray which is the same patient simply re-x-rayed two weeks later there is that subluxation and slip starting to occur at the junction between the um, intermediate cuneiform and the second metatarsal indicating instability in that area. With regards to CT I CT almost all of my Lisfranc injuries um, without exception and the reason for this is I find it very useful in treatment planning there are numerous subtle injuries that can go along with Lisfranc's. 
the subtle nutcracker injury of the cuboid that I'll come to later, um, or little capsular revulsion fractures around adjacent TMT joints that give you an indication that the stability to those joints may have been compromised. And it's very useful to know those uh, capsular revulsions exist before you go into theatre to make sure that you don't leave untreated an area of instability. So I can't emphasize enough, I think CT scan as a preoperative assessment and planning tool for Lisfranc fractures is absolutely essential. With regards to MRI, I don't find that anywhere near as useful. I don't tend to use it uh, on a regular basis. Having said that, I did request one for a list frank injury today. Um, I had a gentleman who presented late having not attended his previous fracture clinic uh, appointments and his function was remarkably good for what looked like a list frank injury. So I've arranged for an MRI scan to see whether it's actually an acute injury or whether it's a more long-standing problem. But aside from that, there's very little information additional that an MRI scan will give you above a CT. People always talk about classification systems and certainly when you're coming close to exams, classification systems are very popular uh, choice of revision. I have to say, I don't find classifications particularly useful in clinical practice in terms of, I don't find them uh, helpful in guiding what treatment strategy I'm going to use. And I don't find them particularly helpful in terms of giving an indication on prognosis. Um, they give you an idea potentially of where to look for the additional injuries, but I don't find them um, in any way useful in my practice. There's a variety of different ones for them detailed here. There's a couple of others that look at the um, ligamentous injury patterns, but I, I don't find them useful in practice. What we do find useful is any form of a uh, treatment strategy. Um, and to a degree, you know, this covers most things in orthopedics, uh, but it would be nice for something a little bit more formal. And there are a variety of treatment strategies out there in the literature that you can identify and see, but they're often they're a little bit more complicated than I think actually is particularly helpful and useful in a day-to-day -day setting. I prefer something much more along this sort of line. And this perhaps represents the fact that I think you do need to be quite aggressive in treating these. First and foremost, when you see them, it is, is the Liz Frank joint injured? And if it's just a simple midfoot sprain without any, um, or midfoot bruise without any significant injury, then the answer may be no, in which case, obviously, you're going to treat it conservatively. If it is injured, then the first question is, is it displaced? If it's displaced, you've got your answers immediately about whether or not you're going to need to do something and you're going to need to go to surgery. I'll come to what you do at that point in a little bit. If it isn't displaced, then you need to know if it's unstable. And that's where your stress x-rays or your weight-bearing x-rays become very important. And I think I would review the stress x-rays as not necessarily a single point. Um, if you have identified an injury to the Lisfranc frank area and you performed a stress x-ray at two weeks and you think the patient is uh, showing a stable uh, Lisfranc frank injury, that is not the end of your assessment of that, uh, that process. I think you need to then repeat those x-rays at a later date during the treatment pathway of that patient. So the way we will look after in our unit, the provisionally stable list frank injury is a stress x-ray at two weeks if we still think it is stable we'll manage it non-weight bearing in a cast for six weeks and that pretty much doesn't matter what the patient's presented you in so quite often you'll get them walking in or limping in or hobbling in in a, in a simple heel offloading shoe or toe offloading shoe put them into a cast keep them non-weight bearing until they reach the six week stage see them back in clinic repeat the x-ray and then I will tend to protect weight bearing them for another six weeks at that stage in a boot until I start being confident enough to get them out of the boot and start walking. And really that's a representation of quite how long it can take for ligamentous injuries around the list frank joint to heal. And you need that confidence that the joint is going to maintain stability before you start moving them on to the next step. If the list frank joint is unstable, however, again, you're going to go towards the surgical intervention. So if it's either displaced or unstable, unless you've got very good reasons, you're looking at a surgical intervention. How you go about intervening surgically is a little bit more up for debate. And this really is the great debate when you're looking at the Liz Frank injuries. Um, essentially, it comes down to one of two options. You either have joint preserving strategies or joint sacrificing strategies, by which I mean primary arthrodesis. The joint preserving ones, there's a little bit more variety in what you can choose. Um, people do still occasionally advocate K-wires. I'm not one of them for reasons I'll show you in a minute. Equally, I'm not a fan of transarticular screws, as I'll discuss in a minute. Um, my preferred option for joint preserving strategies when appropriate is bridge plating. Uh, 
joint sacrificing is a standard arthrodesis technique of your choice to a degree, although you need to be aware that the stability of the area may be slightly compromised and you therefore may need to incorporate a bit more stability into your fixation. But again, I'll come to how I recommend or how I personally uh, pursue that in a minute. To give you a reason why I don't um, like the concept of K-wire fixation as a stabilization. Now, this is just one case, but I think it does illustrate the point. This is a, a, a case who's come to me um, from a uh, another hospital in our region, I'm pleased to say. Um, initially presented a couple of years ago with this injury and was taken to theatre the following day and had, um, I think he was turned into a satellite in terms of K-wire fixation in his foot. And if you look carefully, you can see that the base of the first metatarsal is not well reduced, neither is the interconeiform space. Um, they've simply reduced the foot and tried to stabilize it with the K-wires. Predictably, um, it didn't do well. He went on to develop arth arthritis. Um, he had problems with DBT, chronic pain. By the time we got to him, it was nearly uh, two years down the line, and he's finally had a salvage arthrodesis from which he's doing very well. Uh, but the, the technicality of the surgery in that situation is much more difficult than if you treated it, what I would say is properly first time round. So I do not recommend uh, transarticular K-wires except for very, very specific indications, such as when you're dealing with a very significant soft tissue injury and you're temporizing. With regards to transarticular screws, this has been the gold standard of treatment or the, the standard modality of treatment for a very long time. Uh, and in a lot of places, in a lot of textbooks, in a lot of papers, it does remain so. And certainly when you look at the literature surrounding the, the comparison between um, joint preserving and joint sacrificing procedures, most of the papers will be discussing the transarticular screw technique. It does have some advantages. It's standard hardware that every hospital has on shelf and most orthopedic surgeons or all orthopedic surgeons are familiar with using. It does potentially allow the use of percutaneous techniques. Now, whether that's an advantage or a disadvantage, depends very much on your um, ethos, but you have to remember that the one thing of all of these options that's been shown to be most predictive of outcome has been accuracy of reduction. Therefore, percutaneous techniques are more difficult and may compromise that one factor that is probably the only thing that is the most important thing that you can achieve. There are some articles out there as well that are describing problematic metalwork failure if it breaks. So in other words, if, if you have a screw that's transarticular and it breaks at the joint level, it can continue to cause ongoing articular uh, problems. The people who like transarticular screws or don't like transarticular screws will often talk about the additional chondral damage that's caused when you're passing the screws across the joint. The people who like the transarticular screws will say, well, look, it's minimal. Look at the surface area of the screw that's uh, going across the joint. Even if you add in additional thermal damage from a drill, that's not going to take out a huge portion of the articular surface. Um, certainly a comforting thought if you ever place a screw in the wrong place. Um, I would put it to you, however, that if you let one of your trainees loose with a drill, or even worse, if you let one of your hip surgeons loose, your single transarticular penetration may end up looking less like this and more like this, at which point your chondral damage is going to be significantly higher. That's one of the reasons why I prefer the bridge plating. I think with the bridge plating, you also, by nature of the fact you've got an open reduction, are much more likely to get a better reduction, be able to maintain the reduction. We know that the mechanics are equivalent. Um, we know that there's, as long as you don't, you're careful when you put the plates in, there's not going to be any additional chondral damage. And equally, if you have a metalwork failure when you've got a bridge plating in situ, it's much less likely to cause ongoing damage. Finally, I, I also have to, think that the transarticular screws, although in theory these papers do suggest that the biomechanics are optimal, the, the amount of metal that you can put in place to support a list frank joint which is potentially unstable is less. And you do see these, these problematic um, metalwork failures. As I said, I think that bridge plating such as shown here um, is more likely to give you a better outcome from the basis of the fact that you've improved your reduction. And one thing I think we can take from the papers that compare bridge plate, sorry, uh, transarticular screw fixation to um, the uh, primary arthrodesis is that accuracy of reduction is key. There are some papers that do support the concept of reduced instance of degenerative change with bridge plating above transarticular screws, but I think it's important to realize that these um, uh, these numbers involved in these cases are relatively small, so you may simply be looking at a, a statistical error. Um, 
people do talk about the possible need for additional procedures with plating and there is the possible risk of neurological injury again I'll come to that in a minute or both those issues in a minute my personal practice for um, bridge plating came largely through uh, this study partly because the fact is from James Calder's group in in London and uh, he's who uh, taught me most of my foot and ankle surgery and he was a, a big advocate of bridge plating and has been able to publish some extremely good results looking at the the outcomes of bridge plating in high performance athletes um, and importantly I think it's these bridge plates that he describes were in both bony and ligamentous injuries and he was an advocate of the bridge plating techniques even in the purely ligamentous list Frank. With regards to the additional procedures people do um, talk about that being a routine option when you're doing the bridge plating and a lot of the papers that compare the the uh, joint sacrificing and joint salvage procedures uh, talk about routine metalwork removal as being part of um, the, the surgical profile so they talk about numbers of procedures and they use that removal of metalwork as being a reason not to do a joint a joint um, preserving procedure it's interesting now though that there are starting to be some papers coming out to say that's not necessarily uh, required. So this paper that only came out last year was looking at uh, transarticular screw fixation and even in that situation they did not feel that routine hardware removal was absolutely necessary and I think if I remember the right the number of cases they described were 61 and despite leaving all their metalwork in situ they only had two or three that had problematic metalwork eventually requiring surgery. Similarly um, another paper by Calder's group out this year um, has looked at the instance of deep peroneal nerve injury surrounding treatment of the list frank fractures. It's a very honest paper and he does identify 10% of um, nerve injuries that occur around the primary procedure but on removal of metalwork there is another 15% so a total of 25% rate of deep peroneal nerve injury surrounding uh, the surgical treatment of list frank fractures with bridge plating if the metal work is re routinely removed. As a result, he no longer does routinely remove his, uh, his plates and he's not noticed any increase in symptoms. And this mirrors the practice that I'd actually adopted independently. And I know several others who I've talked to have as well, where I've had a few patients who have done the bridge plating and after they've got to the stage where you might think about removal, which in my hands, I'd start talking to them at about three months, the patients sit there and say, well, I'm fine. Why would you want to take the plate out? I can't feel any stiffness. I'm not aware of any stiffness. The people who, said, who again, talk about the fusing versus transarticular screws or bridge plating will say, well, if you don't remove the metalwork, you're a closet fuser. And I'd, I'd counter that, actually. We know full well that if you've got physiologically important movement around a joint, as you can see in this x-ray here, sooner or later, that metalwork will fail if loaded repeatedly. The important thing is, if you've got uh, extra articular metalwork, that probably is not important. And I now routinely will leave my place in situ unless the patient requests removal. The concept of joint sacrifice in the primary arthrodesis has really um, been pushed is the wrong word, but promote and promote is wrong as well, but um, stimulated by the initial paperwork and work by Chris Cootsey, um, where they found a very strong positive correlation with arthrodesis to better outcomes. They certainly commented on um, uh, a reduced need for revision surgery. And actually, even something as simple as the AOFAS scores were much better after fusion than they were the transarticular screw displacement. They also identified a reduction in uh, late displacement. And you, you're not going to get progressive arthrosis if you have no joint to become arthritic. Um, so this is a, a case that um, just to show you that it's, an, it's a technique that I will um, use occasionally. This is a list frank injury that turned up in our practice. And due to a variety of reasons that I'll come to in a bit, we discussed it with him and he wanted to go for primary arthrodesis. And that's the standard technique that I would use for the primary arthrodesis. The people who don't like primary arthrodesis, and this is one of the concerns that I have about it, is that it does tend to burn your bridges a little bit. Um, arthrodesis in any setting does have an instance of non-union and statistically if you look at the literature a midfoot fusion rate non-union is around about 10 percent. The 
sacrifice of the midfoot joints and midfoot movements is also of slight concern. As we covered at the start of the talk, the second and third metatarsals probably don't move awfully much and are probably superfluous. But the first TMT joint is more functional. And certainly that fusing that area, I think, does cause some ongoing symptoms to the patient and may potentially have longer term sequelae. There just aren't the studies out there to look at the instance of perhaps navicular caneiform or Taylor navicular joint arthritis 10, 20, 30 years down the line from uh, TMT joint fusions. As a final one, metatarsalgia following midfoot fusions is quite difficult to treat. If you get the inclination of your metatarsal wrong and you overload the MTP joint, you can get difficult and symptomatic metatarsalgia. It makes you very unpopular. The most recent meta-analysis that I was able to find when preparing for this talk is this one that was in the Foot and Ankle Surgery Journal last year. And I think this, this is predominantly looking at, um, or most of the papers they found in their study were transarticular screws. But even looking at the most up-to-date literature, there's a suggestion that um, arthrodesis may be associated with better outcomes than RF. But the important feature is that the current literature is limited and it's not sufficient to make strong recommendations. I think the take home from this is really treat your patients as an individual, discuss the options with the patients carefully, and um, you can pretty much defend whichever choice you decide to make. A final thing, that, again, that has been published recently, which I think is actually quite an interesting concept, is this hybrid approach. I personally am not too worried about the concept of fusing the second and third TMT joints. There is this wor the worry about non-union, but the function of those two I do think is probably relatively superfluous. But I do like the idea of, preser of uh, preserving joint movement at the first TMT joint. And this paper from Denmark recently has looked at a hybrid construct where they fuse the second and third TMT joints and they bridge plate temporarily the first TMT joint. They did find that after two years, there was a relatively high instance of osteoarthritis in the first TMT joint evident on x-ray, but very few of those patients had needed to progress towards arthrodesis. And importantly, they did note that um, the bridge plating technique improved the alignment of the first ray overall. And again, it comes back to that um, uh, alignment is probably the most important feature when it comes to patient outcomes. So I, I do think this is quite an interesting concept and it may well be a aspect of practice that I'm, I'm going to adopt going forward. When you're looking at list rank injuries, it's important to keep your eye out for the atypical variants and for these or the atypical fracture patterns that you can see. The nutcracker fracture, if you have the forefoot that's forcibly abducted, you can end up in a situation where the cuboid is essentially crushed between the anterior process, the calcaneum and the uh, fourth and fifth metatarsals. There's the proximal variant, which is looking again at the medial side where the fracture pattern can, rather than be second, third TMT joints, first TMT joint to medial cuneiform, the force actually exits out between the medial and intermediate cuneiforms and, and can damage the uh, navicular cuneiform joint on that ray. Or you can have the isolated medial ray instability, which is quite an unusual fracture pattern, but important to appreciate and important to identify. So examples of those, um, this is a nutcracker fracture and apologies for use of a 3D recon, but it's the easiest way of getting the most information out there. And you can see how the um, fourth and fifth metatarsals have effectively been pile driven into the, into the cuboid, um, which if left alone is going to cause significant problems. You need to work out a way of getting those um, metatarsals disimpacted, stabilized to maintain that lateral foot length. Otherwise, you're going to get an abduction deformity across the, the, the midfoot. The proximal variant is shown here, and you can see clearly how that space between the medial and intermediate cuneiforms is significantly widened. And in this in in instance as well, there is the fracture at the navicular. I'll show you some more pictures on this later. I think the important thing to realize here is that's a spectacular uh, version of one of these. And even subtle widening of that medial intermediate cuneiform space needs to be acknowledged when you're planning your surgical strategy. The final one is that isolated medial ray. If you had a significant dorsiflexion moment across the hallux, you can end up with a simple fracture at the base of the first metatarsal like that, that can uh, provide simple instability of the, of the um, first metatarsal. So what do I do? Um, is it fuse or is it bridge? And actually it's a little bit of both. My preference where possible is to bridge. I prefer to keep that joint movement in the midfoot. 
if I look at it on a case by case basis, I will tend to head towards fusion if there is any evidence at all of pre existing osteoarthritis in the midfoot. From experience, if there is any suggestion that has been ongoing degenerative change there, they're going to grumble at you after a, um, a bridge plating. Any suggestion that the articular surfaces are significantly comminuted, I'm going to again push quite hard towards fusion. Ligament ligamentous injuries, patient dictated at that point. It just is a, with the literature that's out there, I think it's a warning sign that you may be better off with fusion. But again, it's something that I would discuss with a patient. And then it's patient factors. Are they um, BMI 40 and going to do very badly with any form of joint preserving structure? Um, or do they have a strong preference? Do they just want to have one operation? Um, if I, favor, if I look at what makes me go towards bridging, if the articular surfaces are reasonably well preserved, if it's a predominantly bony injury that um, means that once those bones have healed, the stability is going to be restored, uh, the younger age group certainly, and then again, patient factors, patient preference, are they very active, very sporty, do they want to try, do I th think that that maintenance of midfoot movement is more likely to be important? And it's a, it's a discussion that I have on an individual patient with every patient with every, in every case to see which way they would like to go. In some instances, I'll push more towards fusion. In some instances, I'll push more towards bridging. When it comes to how I do it, um, I personally prefer the two incision approach to bridge plating. What I mean by that is it's possible to address the first, second and third TMT joints through a single um, incision over the uh, first, second interspace. I worry about that incision. Certainly when you think about the those literatures where you're talking about the deep perineal nerve injury, we have looked at the landmarks around identifying that deep perineal nerve injury. And in theory, there is a reliable structure, which is the EHB, which should point you in the right direction. And basically where the EHB muscle turns from uh, muscle into tendon, over that transition zone or underneath that transition zone, the deep perineal nerve almost always emerges. And that's a very reliable landmark. It will occasionally come through that zone, but most often it's underneath it. Despite that, 10% will be injured in primary surgery, even in excellent surgeon's hands. So I prefer to try and avoid going too close to that area. Um, I'll therefore tend to address the first TMT joint through a uh, more medial incision, exact location depends on what I'm going to do. For a bridge plate, it's a dorsal medial. And then I'll address the second and third TMT joints through a, an incision placed between the second and third metatarsals. And that's always more lateral than you think. Even with that, it's important that you're aware of where the nerve is, you find the EHB and you keep out the way. Once you're down on bone, you try and sweep the structures out of the way and try not to get too close to that nerve. It seems to be one of those structures that you breathe on it wrong and it gets upset with you. I'll tend to address the first TMT joint first, reduce it both radiologically and under direct vision into a good alignment and put a bridge plate across that. I'll then stabilize the second and third TMT joints and I will also add in a home run screw to reduce that form gap and, and add the structure of that um, uh, Liz Frank ligament. I think one of the important things when you are bridge plating, when you're starting bridge plating, is that the pre-contouring of the plates is vital. You can only see that dorsal surface of the joint. And if you don't pre-contour the plates accurately, then you may well end up with plantar gapping. So you may get a beautifully reduced and, and contoured dorsal surface, but if you haven't accurately bent the plate before you put it on, it may pull the metal parcel up before you and you get more plantar gapping. So you need to be aware of that during your operation, make sure that hasn't occurred. Once I've done that, that's usually the sort of construct I'm looking for. Um, I do prefer to plate the metatarsal cuneiform joints individually. I personally don't particularly like the um, H plates that address all of the areas because I think that doesn't take account the fact there is differential movement between the rays. And as I said, I will always use the home run screw to reduce that area. If it comes to arthrodesis, it varies slightly. Um, I will still use that second incision between the second and third uh, metatarsals, but over recent years I've become an increasing fan of the plantar lapidus plate to um, put the fusion, um, the tension band construct on the correct side biomechanically, and that seems to have had quite a, a dramatic impact on uh, the rates of non-union in our department. Um, with fusions, I will try and combine a screw and plate construct. Even on relatively small individuals, you can get a four or a five mil um, fully threaded or uh, partially threaded CCS screw across the TMT joints with excellent compression. 
I do tend to buttress that up with a plate though. I think a single screw allows a little bit more rotational instability than you might like. And by putting a, a plate to back up a screw, I think you get a, a rotational stability. And again, since adopting that combination, um, we've noticed a, um, a positive impact on our union rate. A further matter with the lesser TMT joints, I'm a strong advocate of bone graft in those areas. I think that it really has, I know the evidence doesn't necessarily support this, and there is no strong evidence for it, but I think putting bone graft in that area does have a positive impact. And I'd much rather do that at the first sitting than have to unpick an non-union and do it later. Uh, with regards to joint preparation technique, it does depend on the, on the morphology of the fracture. First TMT joint, my default now is, is flat saw cuts taking minimal resection, and I'll tend to use those in the less TMT joints if possible, but that sometimes is more difficult if there's a significant degree of combination. Post-op, uh, bridge plating, non-weight bearing in a back slab for two weeks. Well, that's the case for both, actually. Um, but then I'll allow them to touch weight bear in a boot to start letting the ankle move and get a bit of function going in a bridge plating protocol. And I'll allow them to full weight bear in a boot from six weeks. With the fusions, they all tend to keep the non-weight bearing for six weeks um, where possible as a check x-ray at six weeks. And then I'll allow them to start fully weight bearing in normal shoes from then as long as I'm happy with the state of the x-ray. More severe injuries, I will occasionally keep them non-weight bear of weight bearing in a boot for a further six weeks. I think with both of these, it's important that the patients realize that they're in for a long haul. Whether you've bridge plated them, whether you fused them, these injuries take easily 12 to 18 months before their symptoms are starting to settle to a level that they're happy with. And I think they need to know that from the outset. So that's essentially the uh, uh, talk in terms of concepts. I've got a few case examples to show through. Happy to take questions now if anyone has any, or I can um, run through the case examples. And if anyone has any questions as I go through, happy to answer those uh, on an ad hoc basis. Have anyone come through on a text with questions, Lucas? No, there's no question yet. Okay. Thanks. Right. So, uh, in which case I will start with a few case examples. Feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. So the first case to show you, uh, this was one from last year. This is a 17 year old young lady. She was um, training to be actually a reasonably high level gymnast and she fell off the high uh, beam um, sustaining this injury, which was rapidly identified in a and &E, I'm pleased to say. And you can see in the weight bearing x-ray here that there's uh, the little flex sign that exists between the base of the first and second uh, metatarsals, which is almost always indicative of a, this frank pattern injury. Um, the CT scan, which I haven't put up the images, shows fractures involving the second and third TMT joints. With regards to the first ray, that was clearly unstable at um, EUA. And you can see if you look very closely at that weight bearing X-ray, just at the dorsal surface of the uh, medial cuneiform, there's a hint of a small fracture there, which to me is only going to occur if there's been trauma to the first TMT joint. So as a result, we uh, performed our uh, bridge plating technique with the home run screw. Um, she did very well. Uh, she did want the screws to be removed. At six months, we had uh, three, sorry, at three months, we started to have the conversation. And by four months, she was still very keen to have the, the screws and plates removed. They were removed and she was discharged for follow-up eight months following initial injury back to full activity. Jim, there's um, just a question coming in. How do okay. you address the fourth and fifth metatarsal? Good question. I meant to put some slides in about that and forgot to do that. So I think the the key there in the most instances is that you're aiming to maintain stability. Um, as a rule, I know I said I don't like K-wires in um, terms of uh, management of list frank injuries, but I think the fourth and fifth rays are often an exception. If the bony const if the, the bony um, anatomy is well preserved, if you've got um, um, no significant in, uh, fractures at the um, uh, cuboid that is going to compromise things or you can't stabilize that during the operation then I think a, a K wire across the certainly the fourth uh, um, TMT joint and occasionally if you need to the fifth is a reasonable addition to the more stable fixation across the medial side. Um, I'm nervous about the concept of K wire sticking out through the skin when you've put metalwork into the foot. So I will tend to bury the KYs in that situation and then just remove them at a later date through small stab incisions and the local anesthetic. But I, I think KYs for the fourth and fifth is acceptable unless you've got significant combination. Any follow-up or is that okay? Uh, 
think that seems all right. Okay. Um, um, so, <clears throat> yep. Maybe just in general, if anybody likes to jump in, just feel free to unmute your microphone and ask the questions directly to Jim. Okay. So uh, case two, this was uh, again, a referral from adjacent hospital, fortunately not in this situation, but it uh, presented late one night. This was a, a fall from height uh, and he was taken to theater that night by the um, referring unit and stabilized. And the initial stabilization, you may recognize from a slide earlier in the talk, and this is relevant because they've got the, the, the K wire across the fourth TMT joint, um, was as can seen. And this was largely done percutaneously. There was a uh, initial attempt at reduction. They felt that the reduction was adequate and they put in percutaneous screws. They've done some things quite well. They've got the home run screw in the right place. They've stabilized the first TMT joint uh, with a screw and they've also addressed, they've recognized the fact there is a proximal variance and they've stabilized these cuneiform joint. But I think if you look at it closely, you can see that actually almost none of that is adequately reduced. The first TMT joint is subluxed. The second TMT joint is um, looking decidedly ropey. And I think it's interesting to note as well that this was done and definitive stabilization was put into place before a CT scan had been performed, despite that severity of injury. And therefore, they had no real understanding or um, ability to comment on the state of those articular surfaces or the joint complexes when they then put definitive fixation in later. As a result, therefore, within a few months, the predictables happened. The metal work has failed and there's a progressive ongoing subluxation with a patient who is very unhappy uh, about the state of his foot. He has symptomatic uh, instability across his midfoot and progressive arthrosis affecting at least the medial three rays. And in this situation where you have a, um, a failed fixation of a previous list frank, it's really quite a challenging procedure. There is only one option, which is what we've done here, which is progress towards fusion, but you're not dealing with a fusion of a pristine joint. What you tend to find is that that um, medial column instability that's more proximal creates real issues in, in returning the, the foot to a foot shape. Those, that medial cuneiform tends to rotate and come out and to actually get adequate exposure and uh, reduce that to give you a stable platform and sufficient um, bolt to put your uh, medial fixation on is quite challenging. So these really are quite a, a, a challenging case to do. Having said that, the, uh, this chap did very well. And at three months following the surgery, he was far more concerned about his iliac crest than he was about the foot. And uh, he's now been in the, in the realms of COVID discharged a telephone follow-up. Uh, expectation is hopefully he will do well. But there you can see again that people are worried about the concept of a five millimeter CCS uh, across the uh, M uh, TMT joints. The transarticular screws, all of those are five millimeter screws. They do fit very well and they do give you very good, very strong uh, compression and bite into the cuneiforms. All right, Jim, now a few questions are coming in. First from okay. Vish Kumar, great talk. What's your approach for the plantar plating when fusing? So for the plantar plate, you need to go direct medial. Um, if you you go sort of between where the, the skin is slightly abnormal on the plantar side, it's got that slightly altered texture to the more normal dorsal skin. And you can uh, basically an extension of the same approach you'd use for a scarf and ache and osteotomy. Um, you obviously need to identify the um, tibialis anterior tendon and protect it. But that plate that's uh, shown on the x-rays um, if you look on the AP view, it's a hockey stick shaped plate, which is also pre-contoured on the um, uh, lateral view to fit nicely onto a standard first TMT joint. And it's designed to skirt around the insertion of the tibialis anterior tendon. So I'll do the direct medial approach, prepare the joints as, as described earlier. And then the five millimeter CCS screw will go from the dorsal surface of the first metatarsal into the plantar uh, aspect of the medial cuneiform. Um, always tends to look like it's in the navicular cuneiform joint on that AP view, as you see there. But then we look on the lateral, it's obviously more plantar. Um, and then you can go around underneath through the same approach and place that plantar screw. You have to remember that the plantar aspect of the first metatarsal isn't completely flat and tucked around the corner. There's that slope that if you look, you know, Baruch always used to talk about as to the guide as to the angle of his screws, that you can place that, that plate underneath. It's a little tight, it's a little bit of a fiddle, but I think the payback in terms of improving the biomechanics of that structure and construct are very much worth that extra effort in doing it. All right, that I think was a 
Great answer. So then from Robbie Ray, great talk, Jim. I used to do two incisions, as you said, but moved to an OPI approach with one incision and three windows. This way I can test the TN joint and NC joints with the McDonald's and can bridge as necessary. Uh, I do it more frequently than I initially thought I would. How do you access these joints through uh, two incisions? Uh, as in the interconnect form, um, Rabbi, or the uh, navicular canal form? Uh, both, Jim, the NC joints and also all the way up to TN joint. Just, just so the, um, I check them all. So the, if it's um, uh, a bridge plating construct I'm going for, then the medial incision um, is over the dorsum of the first ray. And you can take that back up to get to the medial aspect of the tail joint. And you're effectively coming just adjacent to the tibialis anterior by the time you get back that far, which is actually the approach that I would tend to use for fusing those joints in the first place. And then likewise, the more lateral incision, you can come back up further. And on a couple of occasions, I have had to open the navicular canariform joints um, through that more lateral incision to get to the lateral raise. Admittedly, that's because I've broken a bit of wire or something in that joint, but you can actually get up to and you can see into those joints if you need to. Um, with regards to the intricate airform joints, you can, from that incision on the, it's more, it, it, it is always a more lateral position than you than you think it's going to be. So no matter how far lateral you think you've gone with your more lateral incision, you still tend to come down on that lateral border of the second metatarsal. And when you're down onto the metatarsal and the cuneiform, you can come across and see into the intercuneiform joint from there as well. So I think you can see both the IC joints and the NC joints through those two incisions if necessary. Slightly more difficult if your medial incision for diffusion is uh, a true medial incision, because then you're, sneak, you're, you're trying to sneak in through that uh, medial window. I'm sure you can, it's just not something I've ever had to, had to do. Thanks. Okay. All right. Perfect. Then another question from uh, Marius Kumiki. Uh, hey, Jim, do you notice shortening of the first uh, three rays following arteriodesis? Any advice how much resection is acceptable? As little as you can possibly get away with, I think is the clue to that. You do get some shortening of the first ray. And I think that's one of the reasons why I prefer the concept of um, bridge plating the first ray, even if you're looking at fusing the second and third. It's one of the things I thought was particularly interesting about that paper. Um, when you're doing the resections for um, the fusions, I think just just taking off the articular surface and a small sli the smallest sliver of bone you can get through the uh, base of the metatarsal and the and the cuneiform joint is essential. The key is that they're deep dark joints, and you really need to make sure that, that um, a resection is even on both sides. Um, I'm not too worried about some slight shortening of the second and third. I think you're more likely to run into problems by overloading those joints by getting your inclination wrong. Um, so I think those two joints do tolerate that bit of shortening, especially if you've maintained the lengths in the first ray. And by maintaining the length in the first ray, you're therefore um, maintaining the load bearing primarily underneath the hallux um, and therefore maintaining the tripod effect. If you fuse the um, medial side, then I think you you are more likely to run into problems with uh, so the first TMT joint. I think there is the potential to run into problems with some shortening, but that's where you really absolutely have to keep your resection to an absolute minimum. Mm -hmm. And will routinely fuse ICs? Um, not necessarily. Um, if the if there is a um, a proximal variant, and so the You've, you've got that instability in the area and you are doing a, um, a fusion procedure, then yes, I will tend to go for fusion in that area as well. If I'm trying to stabilize it, then yes, I will fuse it. Um, I don't tend to try and fuse the interval between the um, medial and lateral, uh, so the intermediate and lateral cuneiforms. I've never known that to be a problem, but that uh, instability that can arise between the, me the medial and intermediate, I think does occasionally need formal fusing, in which case I will prepare that joint formally and occasionally use bone graft in that area as well. Perfect. Then from uh, Ryu, uh, athlete, athletes do well, but um, they do not get back to the same intensity, um, respectively well reported in American footballers journal, Michael et al. 2016. Yeah, no, there, there is definitely an, in, an instance of them not getting back. And that was one of the reasons when uh, James Calder's paper first came out, it was very interesting. Um, the athletes that he looked at in his uh, were premiership rugby players, premiership football players, which you could argue are at least as demanding as the American football players. Um, they, they, they certainly do not all get back. And I, uh, the last thing I would want to try and suggest is that if you bridge plate 
the um, all of these injuries, they will all get back. It is a very, very significant foot injury. It is not necessarily the end of a career, but the patients need to know that that is a possibility um, and that it, they are up against it. I've had exactly that conversation today with a soldier. Okay. Uh, then another question from uh, Marius Kumiki again. Another question, please, is regarding the comminuted impact that cuboid fractures. Is plating enough to restore the length and stability of the lateral column? Uh, give me half a second. Uh, I'll come back to that one in a minute. And we'll talk about this chap. Um, so this is a case example that just exa uh, illustrates exactly that point, actually. Um, this was one I looked after a few years ago. He's an international level show jumper. And um, he uh, fell from the horse, got his foot caught in the stirrup. When the foot came out of the stirrup, the horse, to add insult to industry, stomped on him. So he had a combination of sort of twisting, uh, forced injury, landing on the foot in a plant flex position, and then the horse standing on his foot. So he really did a very good job on himself. Um, the CT scan was that uh, fracture I showed you earlier with the 3D reconstruction, where you could see that the uh, fourth and fifth metatarsals were impacted directly into the cuboid. In addition to that, there was common use of fracture at the base of the third metatarsal. There was a fracture involving the second TMT joint and some uh, bone debris around the first TMT joint that was indicating a degree of disruption there. And so I really went into this foot uh, with a lot of options available as to what I was going to do. Um, that's the so you can just see the first at the top of the first TMT joint there was that small little fracture that you can't get that unless you've disrupted the plantar ligaments um, and then the lateral side had progressively more severe injuries because you went across um, so what we did as I mentioned I had lots of different strategies going into that I wasn't sure how I was going to get those uh, fourth and fifth TMT joints out. I had a small X fix available that I could have potentially jacked it out. Um, I had a very long one third tubular plate that I was considering putting between the uh, fifth or fourth metatarsal across onto the neck of the, of the calcaneus to, to jack it out. As it happened, once I'd um, uh, opened it and looked, there were some reasonable sized fragments, both on the medial and lateral side. And I was able to put a locking plate to hold that distal articular surface, almost like an internal X-fix of the one bone, out to length. Um, and at that point, the fourth and fifth TMT joint stabilized. They're obviously not normal. I'm not going to try and suggest they are, but they were stable and out to length. Um, and then I fused the um, the remaining TM, uh, second, th second, third, and, uh, first, second, and third TMT joints. Um, the combination of constructs that you see is a representation of the fact that I also plated the second um, uh, metatarsal and I didn't want to try and do a plate that went all the way up from the intermediate cuneiform down to the neck of the second metatarsal, but equally I didn't want to have a gap between two plates, so he's had a compression uh, staple uh, stabilization of the second, and he actually went on very well. Um, despite the degenerative change that's apparent at the less TMT joints, he has no pain there. Um, I saw him earlier this year um, as he'd had an injury on another area. And the only point of tenderness for him is the fact that I put that first TMT joint screw in too long. And he's got a little bit of irritation from the head of the first TMT uh, joint transarticular screw. Not sufficient that he wants it removed, just sufficiently reminds me of it every time he sees me. Um, I think when you've got therefore a cuboid that you can get out, that you can rebuild, you may be able to get away without bridge plating or, or almost sort of external fixation for it. And it's a concept that I think is worth exploring. If that doesn't work, if the damage is too severe, then I think you effectively need to make sure that you can restore that lateral column length. And if you need to, that can either be through an external fixator or through a uh, internal external fixator by a long bridging plate that will then obviously need to come out later. On the second mat, are those staples or? They are. They're Nissenol compression staples. Um, ah, okay. I was, so when I, did you decide to go for a staple and went for a plate or? Um, staple was my was my old default when I first started practice. It was one of the ways I'd seen done, and I quite like the concept of ongoing compression. Mm -hmm. um, so in this situation, it was purely done because I didn't want a short plate or. Um, uh, adjacent to a, a longer plate plate in the metatarsal. So I didn't want to have sort of two plates with a small gap in the middle and a stress riser. Um, so the other option I had on the shelf was Nissenol staples. Okay, they, fine. They worked very well. 
in this instance. Okay. I think as a as a default, normally I worry about the stability that they give, and I, I don't like them as a as a, a more permanent option. Mm -hmm. Okay, another example of uh, the slightly um, varied one. This was again one of the, one of the X-rays that I showed you earlier. This was that proximal variant. She was a low energy kitchen fall and a 34 year old housewife, um, otherwise fit and well, just had this rather nasty proximal variant on the medial side. And you can see on the CT scan that there's uh, both avulsion fractures at the Lis Frank ligament and the combination of the navicular. Um, and this was a rather unusual one where we um, fused the intercuneiform joint, fused the um, uh, medial uh, cuneiform, navicular cuneiform joint, and then added the home run screw. Um, and again, she was one that, that did remarkably well. Um, she was discharged at nine months with no further follow-up required. Um, interestingly, she has had a further fall two or three years later, and the home run screw is broken, uh, but has not caused her any problems. So nearly there, if people are still with me. Um, I mentioned briefly that proximal variant. Um, of the first metatarsal, not the proximal variant, sorry, the isolated medial instability with, with fracture. And I think this is where you just need to be thinking a little bit clearly about what causes the stability of these joints. Um, this was a 15-year-old chap who just fell mucking around with his brother again in the kitchen, the dangerous places. And on the actual CTs, there was clear instability arising from this metatarsal. There was not a congruent TMT joint for the remaining fragment. Um, and um, we decided to address it. The initial plan was to buttress plate that. And I have to say that was uh, inexperienced in my behalf looking at the location of that fracture. And it was far, far, far more lateral than I appreciated when I was looking at the CT scan. And if you do get these, I encourage you to look at it very carefully because that caused me a lot of confusion inoperatively. But we were able to stabilize it with um, two CCS screws, two three millimeter CCS screws. And again, he's done extremely well. Um, no ongoing symptoms, which I think was um, uh, a good outcome for him. Um, last one was a cautionary tale. Um, this is just to show that I'm not showing all my good results. This was a 55-year-old lady who was actually the senior sister on our trauma and orthopedic ward who did the classic slip off the curb, uh, sustaining a Lis Frank injury, um, which was fortunately identified. Um, and she had that uh, characteristic dusting at the base of the first metatarsal, as well as comminuted intraarticular fractures. Now, if I was to look at this now, I would look at that second TMT joint and I'd say there's not an awful lot of joint space there that would be quite suggestive of ongoing degenerative change, especially in a 55 year old lady who spent her entire career on her feet. And that might have pushed me more towards a different way of treating it. But at the time, it's optimistic and um, I bridge plated her. Uh, the operation went fine and um, I was very pleased with the result, but she was one of those unlucky ones that had a deep perineal nerve injury at the time of the initial operation. She was one I did through a single incision um, and is probably the individual that's been most influential and pushed me away from that. Um, she had ongoing symptoms. Um, we took the plates out. We um, injected her. Ultimately, we went on to do revise her to a, um, a fusion with bone grafting. Um, we dealt with the uh, deep perineal nerve injury by finding it proximally and burying it into the navicular. Um, and um, she has done okay. But I think she is one of, those, one of those ones that you wish you'd done differently at the time. And I think if I had my time again with her, she would have been one that I would have done. I'd have paid more attention to the possibility of pre-existing degenerative change and I'd have primarily fused her. So in conclusion, um, before I take any further questions, I think it's very important that you don't look at the Lis Frank injury as a single entity. There is a very wide variety, both in terms of patient and injury characteristics you can get, and you need to have a full armory of possible techniques, whether it's bridge plating, fusion, uh, whatever you choose to do to address these. You need to take each individual and each, each patient uh, as an individual. On occasion, you need to understand the anatomy and the mechanics of not just the joints themselves, but of the, how the injuries occurred and be aware for those nutcracker injuries, proximal variants that may otherwise um, steer you astray. And I think it's also important to realize that both arthrodesis and ORIF 
can give you good outcomes. And if anything, the weight of the literature supports arthrodesis ahead of RF. I have a slight feeling that I think um, the bridge plating is underrepresented in the literature. It's a more new technique. And I think as we go forward, we may find that the bridge plating will at least be equal to, the, to arthrodesis. But at the moment, I think it's safe to say that you can justify whichever technique you choose to. And I think it's both the factors of the injury and the characteristics of the patient that you need to understand carefully and discuss the options very carefully with the patient before you make the definitive treatment choice. And I think it really is one of those injuries that you have to have the patient on board before you start the process of treating because they're gonna be with you for a long time and they are one of those injuries that grumbles for a long time before they settle down fully. And that's it. Any questions? I think no more questions so far, but uh, yeah. Uh, also, Maris, excellent talk, detailed and very comprehensive. And I also need to say here, yeah, it was a very engaging and beautiful presentation. I think you you, you covered this topic really, really well. And um, yeah, also, thank you so much from my side for preparing this beautiful talk. And um, yeah, if there are any more questions, please feel free to ask. Excellent talk here again from Ryu, from Josh. A lot of people loved it as it looks. Thank you very much, guys. I hope I hope it was enjoyable. <laughs>